Hello, my name is Simon de Rockaldson. Um, I'm a medical doctor at the Landspitale, the National University Hospital of Iceland, and I'm a PhD candidate, uh, part of the ISTOP team in Iceland. So this is a study that I presented at this year's ASH about monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance or MGUS in COVID-19. And as you can see, there are, there are loads of co-authors included, including Sigurd Christensen, the, the principal investigator of the ISTOP MM study. So, I don't think COVID-19 needs any specific introduction. You all know it, I know it. That's why we're here in this you know, virtual space or why, why many of you watched Ashed at Home or have been staying at home uh, lately. But, um, and as many of you probably know as well, uh, multiple myeloma patients seem to have a, an increased risk of severe COVID-19 and have an increased risk during this pandemic. Um, and this is believed to be related to disease-related immunosuppression rather than treatment effects. So MGUS is this precursor of myeloma, and it's pretty common in the general population and has been associated with dysfunctional immunity and, and blood clots and kidney disease and, and infections, including uh, an increased risk of viral infections. So that really posed the question whether MGUS had sort of significance during COVID-19. Uh, and until this study, there was no organized data on this. And this study was actually published uh, at the beginning of this month, on December 1st, in, in the Blood Cancer Journal. So you can check it out there as well. So the aim of this study was to leverage the data from the ongoing ISTOP MM study, where we have already screened these 75,000 individuals, to learn more about whether individuals with MGUS have increased risk in this era of COVID-19. And we do this by answering two key, key questions which are whether MGUS is associated with an increased risk of contracting SARS-CoV-2 or whether and whether MGUS is associated with an increased risk of severe COVID-19. So just to set the stage a little bit, I'll do this briefly, um, is that uh, because the study is done in Iceland, so the first case was diagnosed in, in February 2020, and early on the authorities started a very aggressive uh, strategy of testing and tracing with population-based screening, and self-ordered uh, PCR testing with same day results really early on. Um, and really early on, the Iceland was, uh, had one of the highest testing rates in the world, but other, uh, as, as other nations caught on, it sort of became in the middle there. All testing was registered centrally and everyone who was diagnosed with COVID was followed by the same health or telehealth team in, at the National University Hospital in Reykjavik. Uh, so individuals with COVID-19 were contacted most often daily, and um, when clinical deterioration was detected during these telehealth uh, appointments, um, people or these individuals were called in uh, to a spe special COVID-19 outpatient clinic for further evaluation if needed. So that's the setting that we're doing this study. And, uh, all this data on COVID-19 and this follow-up was very centralized and registered at the same place. And we cross-linked data from this follow-up to those who were in the ISTOP MM study at that time, who had been screened for MGUS. And uh, uh, we then did two analyses. First analysis COVID, we call the susceptibility analysis, where we use a so-called test negative study design, where we only include those have been tested and, uh, for COVID-19 during the year 2020. And this is a standard procedure, for example, in vaccine studies uh, or vaccine efficacy study, for example, for influenza and so on. Um, in the second analysis, we included those who were diagnosed with COVID-19 and then followed them while they had COVID-19 for hospital admission or death or uh, as a composite endpoint together. Uh, and then as another composite endpoint, uh, requiring urgent evaluation of these COVID-19 clinics because of clinical deterioration, hospital admission, and death. So these were our definitions of severe COVID-19. We then used a, a statistical method called logistic regression, adjusting for, for age and sex. And here's a flow chart of the study. So we ended up with these 72,000 eligible participants if we excluded those who uh, had died or, or had myeloma before the um, start of the pandemic. And then we included these, ended up with 32,000 individuals who had been tested for SARS-CoV-2 and ended up with just over a thousand individuals who, who actually had COVID-19. And I'll just like to show you these tables here. Um, this is for the first susceptibility analysis. And as you can see, those who have MGUS are a little bit older, more likely to be male, and they have uh, slightly higher rates of SARS-CoV-2 positivity, but 
After adjusting for age and sex, which are crucial co co uh, confounders in this study, we did not find a statistically significant difference. And this is actually illustrated as well in a nicely here in this graph showing those who have uh, MGUS here in purple and those who don't have MGUS here in green. And here on the y-axis is the probability of testing SARS-CoV-2 positive. positive. And here is uh, the risk as it changes by age. So as you can see, the lines are very close and the gray areas called the confidence interval overlap very significantly. And that really shows that there's really no difference between the two groups. So here we can see that there is not an increased risk of having a SARS-CoV-2 positive test if you have MGAS. So with the second analysis, the severity analysis, um, we can see the same thing. Those who have MGAS are a little bit older, more likely to be male. And the, the numbers here for severe COVID-19 are a little bit higher, but after adjusting for the for, uh, crucial confounders, age and sex here in this analysis, we could not find a statistically significant difference here in the primary uh, analysis here. And this is illustrated actually very nicely in this graph, showing these two lines are virtually superimposed and the confidence intervals here uh, overlapping completely really shown that there is no trend or anything towards uh, MGUS uh, affecting severity in this cohort. So in conclusion, after uh, doing this study where we follow thousands or tens of thousands of individuals who have been screened for MGUS, um, we uh, did not find MGUS to be associated with contracting SARS-CoV-2 or increased severity uh, once infected. And a very key thing to have keep in mind here is that this is a screen cohort. So these individuals actually um, were asymptomatic and they were screened. So they were not diagnosed with MGUS during clinical workup for something else like arthritis and like that. And we actually had a study, which you can see in another webcast, uh, I understand, um, on how, these, how, this, uh, how this cohort that we have differs significantly from the cohort of other studies. And I think that's a very key strength, a key thing to keep in mind here. And this keeps the co our card uh, uniquely uh, unbiased in this respect because it don't have a more uh, underlying diseases just because uh, of this clinical MGUS. Um, an important limitation though is that there's a relatively low rate of COVID-19 and MGUS. So we have relatively low numbers. Uh, and fortunately, uh, mortality for COVID-19 has been quite low in Iceland, so we had to use these composite endpoints. So not just uh, uh, death as the key endpoint, but we had to put together things like hospital admission and needing to go to the COVID-19 outpatient clinic as a sort of a composite endpoint, which is a little bit weaker, but still um, a very valid sign of severe COVID. Um, the results are a little bit surprising. You would think that the precursor to myeloma had um, would have an increased risk in COVID-19, just like myeloma. Furthermore, in, in previous studies on MGUS, we've seen that there's an increased risk of infections. And, and the question is, is COVID special or are previous studies biased? And that comes back to the point that I made earlier on this um, screen cohort, because the previous studies showing an increased risk of infections actually include individuals who were diagnosed during the work for other diseases like uh, uh, rheumatological diseases, kidney disease, and so on, who have an, uh, have an increased risk of infections because of that. So that might actually mean that this uh, study uh, actually shows the true risk of infections in, in MGUS individuals, which I think is very important. Um, and the implications really are that uh, the results highlight the differences between MGUS and myeloma. And just to put it into terms that we understand here in, in Iceland, we have these two volcanic eruptions here. So on the on the Left side, we have the Eyjafjallajökull eruption of 2010, which disrupted airline travel all over the world. Um, while here on the right side, we have a very recent volcanic eruption just a few weeks ago in the Reykjanes Peninsula here, really close by uh, the capital area where I live, um, which is a, a much smaller eruption, did not cause any airline air traffic dis disruption, but still very important to monitor. So this, these are really in the Icelandic terms, myeloma, a very severe uh, thing where things have really gotten out of control and then MGUS, which is a more sort of uh, under the surface. Um, but I think the most important implications of our study is that the findings can inform how individuals with MGUS 
view the risks during the pandemic and how we or, or we as physicians uh, advise uh, individuals with MGUS during the pandemic. So the results are reassuring because we find that MGUS is not associated with an increased risk of MGUS. But I think it's important still to keep in mind that um, it is still likely that when you get to a more extreme of, of very high risk MGUS, so when you get to you know smoldering myeloma or so on, that these uh, results might actually not be valid for that group. So it's a bit, um, so we have to be a bit um, cautious with, with those individuals who are, or have uh, some kind of immune deficiency or have more advanced precursors. And I think it's really important to keep in mind that the key thing here is to stay masked and, and, uh, and get your vaccines. And that applies to everyone, those who have and those who don't have MCAS. So that's what I want to say about this study. Thank you. Thank you. I want to especially thank our collaborators. I want to thank uh, the IMF and the Black, Research, or Black Swan Research Initiative and the Binding Site for making I Stop Mem a reality. Thank you for having me.